that should have started recording. OK, so I'm now going to hand over to Mary Colwell, who is the director of Care You Action. Thank you, Ellen. And um, I mean, we were all when we first thought about doing these seminars, just general introduction to the, the problems that curlews face in the sort of modern landscape, um, just an hour long and dotted through the year, we thought, well, we maybe get, I don't know, 50 people and 250 have signed up. So we're completely thrilled about that. Um, yeah. Delighted that so many people are interested. So thank you to everybody who's, who's signed up tonight. And we're kicking off with one of the big, big issues, which is curlews on farmland. Um, and I'm going to leave the explanation to our esteemed guests, but just very quick introduction, if you could wave esteemed guests when I say your name. So first of all, I'll be talking to Mike Smart. That's Mike Smart waving. And um, Mike is part of Curlew Action. He's a trustee, but also he's our field worker. He's out at the moment every day in the field, uh, working in the Seven and Avon Vales. Uh, Curlew's nesting on farmland down there. So we'll be talking to him about his experiences of working with birds in these lowland areas. And then our next guest will be Richard Hanby. Richard could give us a little wave. There's Richard. And Richard is actually a beef farmer in Gloucestershire. And he's gonna give us a farmer's perspective of what it's like to try and run a farm and look after birds like curlews. And then we're going to finish uh, this conversation with Jake Fines. We're really very fortunate to have Jake. Give us a wave, Jake. As <laughs> Jake. Jake is a, is a renowned conservationist. He is the conservation manager for the Holcombe Estate in Norfolk. He's on the board of Natural England and, um, and he has the big overview of how we're going to fit together nature and agriculture in the future and has lots of interesting thoughts and is actually doing a lot of that work himself on the Holcombe Estate. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Mike to unmute yourself, Mike. And uh, we'll start by you sharing your screen with us, your presentation. Just say Mike and I first met in 2016, just before I set off on my curly walk. And he and a guy called Phil Sheldrake uh, were working on the, the curlews in uh, Gloucestershire. And I went up to meet them before I did my walk. And so we've known each other since then. And Mike's an extraordinary field ornithologist, worked all his life on birds in the field um, all over the world. And um, when I said he's retired, he said, I am not retired. I am fully employed and work, and he is working on curlews in Gloucestershire. So over to you, Mike, if you want to show us your presentation. Thank you, uh, Mary. Um, okay, right. So here's the, here's the topic, lowland curlews in the Severn and Avon Vales, <clears throat> because there are lots of Avons, that's the Gloucestershire and Worcestershire Avon. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, here you have um, some, uh, basically the background. There are little, little pockets of these breeding curlews that survive in many areas of lowland England, uh, the Severn Vale, Thames Valley, Somerset levels and places like that. Many, um, Many nest on farmland so that cooperation with landowners and farmers is essential if these very vulnerable populations are to, uh, to survive. And along the Severn and Avon Vales, um, we've been looking at them for at least 20 years. And in, um, in the last three years, the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust uh, has developed a project uh, to, to look more closely at the curlews and to conserve them in the vales. Next one, please. Some pictures to illustrate. We, it is a floodplain. Uh, that's um, that. That's from um, I think it was in November uh, a few years ago. Uh, that those are meadows below Richard's farm. Uh, the the building you can see is the hide which is used by uh, Gloucester Wildlife Trust people to uh, to look at the um, uh, what ought to be a, a meadow with scrapes. But as you can see, when the Severn is very high, it really does get very wet. Next, please. 
And here's another picture of, uh, this is Tewkesbury Ham. Uh, the Ham is an area close to the, uh, to the town of Tewkesbury. There, there's the Abbey in the background. Uh, it's normally used by people walking around uh, for recreation, but as you can see, it does flood. Next one, please. That's what it looks like in summer. This is one of our, our best curlew sites. Uh, it's a huge meadow um, uh, along the Avon. It's um, and it's an SSSI. And here we um, uh, we have six or seven pairs of curlew nesting every year. Next one, please. And. It should also be said that these meadows are of very high botanical value. Our studies of curlews have made us realize just how good these meadows are. Some of the um, botanical bodies didn't really uh, rate these to start with simply because they weren't very well known. And the curlew um, studies have taken us out to look at, um, at, at the botany of the sites as well. Next one, please. So farming in the floodplain, it's, you're pretty sure that it's going to flood in the winter. It often does in spring and may occasionally even do so in, in summer. Therefore, arable farming in these floodplain sites isn't a practical possibility. So the traditional form of farming through this area is, is to uh, let the hay grow, take a late crop in June or July with grazing by cattle or sheep until the autumn floods arrive. And the breeding curlews and indeed other waders too have survived in, in these meadows, whereas in other parts of the two counties uh, where there isn't the flooding, uh, there's been much more arable and much earlier silage cutting. So that, that um, the, the, the farming uh, tradition is absolutely essential for the curlews to nest. Next. That's a, a map of the area we're talking about. You can see um, Gloucester's down at the bottom, Worcester is up at the top, and the spots mark places where curlews have bred more or less recently. Different colours just mean uh, whether they succeeded or not. You can see the two rivers, the Severn coming down from the north, and then the Avon coming in from the uh, northeast from um, uh, Eversham and uh, Stratford. Uh, sh it shows very clearly where the line of, uh, of, of most curlews are, and the other ones dotted around are, are really um, just much less concentrated. Next. That's what the, the egg looks like. They're ground nesters. That was a, a, a clutch I found and photographed relatively early in the season. That's a full clutch of four. That's what it looks like. They're gorgeous, great big, great big eggs. Uh, the birds nest in, in that long grass. The nests are horribly difficult to find because they're in great big fields. Uh, so the almost the only way to find them is to watch the birds back onto the nest from a distance. Next. And that's that's what sadly often happens to them. Predation is a huge problem. Uh, an awful lot of the uh, nests get predated, usually by foxes or crows, uh, and th there is heavy predation on the, on the nests in the fields. Next. So how do you approach conservation of these birds? Initially, when we started, we thought, let's Let's just look, watch them from a distance, Not don't disturb them, just keep an eye on them, see what's happening. But there are so many threats which um, affect them. Uh, predators, habit change, habitat change, agricultural accidents like mowing um, or chicks getting crushed. And um, this means that we realized that what we were doing just by standing back and looking from a distance, we were just monitoring extinction, watching them go extinct. Um, the number of chicks they they produce is minimal because of all these threats. So we're now adopting a more interventionist approach where we're putting electric fences around the nests. Um, we talk as much as possible to the farmers and landowners on whose land they're nesting and um, and try and make arrangements so that if we know there's a, a curlew nest or curlew chicks, uh, they, they they leave an area uncut uh, for um, 
uh, and, and don't squash them. And we hope that what we can do once we've developed this meth methodology, it can be rolled out more widely to help all the other pockets of breeding curlews in other areas. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That's a, a really nice overview. And uh, that's one you put where you put uh, colours on them, don't you? On the left. Oh, yes. Sorry, I've, I've forgotten that. Uh, yes. The, the thing is, you see, see these rather beautiful, but but rather discreetly coloured brown birds uh, wandering around in the fields. And you it's very difficult to interpret their behaviour. What are they actually doing? So we've tried uh, to mark them with colour rings like this one here. You can see it's got um, uh, a yellow flag with a, a, a numbers or letters on it. Once you can identify an individual, you can understand so much better what it's doing. Is it the female which is going to sit? Is it the male looking after the chicks? Who, um, if they're chasing, is it the male chasing uh, another male or is it a male um, interacting with another female? Just have, being able to identify them uh, individually increases enormously your, um, your understanding of what they're doing. Um, of course, we have to be very careful catching them. They're very nervous birds. There's a there's a risk of make of them uh, deserting their nests if you do it at the wrong time. There are always risks of accidents of the catch catching thing going wrong. So we do it very carefully. Uh, but we think it's uh, it, it does cause some stress to the birds. But we think. If it allows us to understand better what they're doing, it's worth it, worth taking the risk in the long run. But we are very careful about it. Thank you, Mike. That's fantastic. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, do put them in the chat box and um, Ellen and Alex will be collating them for later. So anything that occurs to you when you're listening and you want to ask, do do that and we'll ask questions at the end. But a couple of questions from me, Mike. So you work in the Seven and Avon Vales. Uh, part of it is floodplain, part of it is higher ground and doesn't flood, so is, is more traditional, you know, intensively farmed, I should say. Um, but that's only one habitat for lowland curlews. Just give us a very brief yeah. overview of the other habitats that they occupy in lowland England. It's really quite... Um... We, we think that the curlews spread from the uplands uh, probably in the late 19th and early 20th century when there were large areas of upland which held curlews, probably with Victorian gamekeepers and uh, control measures, uh, they probably did quite well. And they, um, they then probably spread out into the lowlands but then with agricultural change in the 20th century and increasingly intensive farming, uh, a lot of these, the lowland birds uh, uh, just disappeared because, because of um, use of silage, change of habitat uh, and the eternal predator problem. Um, so we've, these, these um, low floodplain areas, flood, floodable areas, um, seem to be some of the best areas left for them. That's what's happened, say, Somerset Levels, Tam Thames Valley, um, the Lug Valley in Herefordshire, um, the Gloucestershire Seven and Avon. Uh, but there are places like, like Dartmoor, for instance, where Dartmoor and Exmoor used to be quintessentially curlew areas, but they've now almost they've now lost almost all their their their, their curlews. Um, and, and indeed, they probably used to nest in extensively on, on the top of the Cotswolds, going from Gloucestershire up into Oxfordshire and across in, into Berkshire. Very few left there now. Um, it, it's largely because of the intensification of, uh, of, of farming. So, and th these birds are incredibly site faithful. They come back year after year to the same place. They um, and once they lose their their sight, it's unlikely they will move somewhere else. So it's always easier to look after ones you've got than to try and reintroduce them into new areas. That's a very tricky business, which is why we're concentrating so much on looking after the birds we've got rather than trying to um, 
reintroduce them into possibly sites where they once were, but where there isn't a tradition of them any longer. You said how many pairs do you have in the Seven and Aiden Vales? 30, 30-ish, 30 to 35 regularly. And you said they're producing very few chicks. Can you give us some indication of how bad it is in terms of chick production? Well, the, um, the scientists say that in order to maintain the actual uh, numbers of curlews uh, anywhere, but in, in Britain in particular, they need to produce point, point 0.5 of a chick every year. That's one chick every two years. They're not even doing that. They are crashing. Even they're not. The wild birds are not producing one chick every, even one chick every two years per pair. Um, we reckon in the last five years, um, our thirty-five pairs have probably produced about ten chicks each year to to, to fledging. Where to, to, so they ought to be producing 15 or 20 uh, to maintain the population. And the population hasn't dropped. So why is that? Maybe our birds, extra adults coming in from outside, are we attracting them into a, um, a rather uh, un unsafe and unsteady uh, population? We don't know. That's one of the things we need to look at as well. That's incredibly low productivity then, 10 chicks a year. Yep. Um, it just is, uh, you know, despite what you're doing and, you know, putting up nest fences and, and so on, you know, we are looking at losing them in lowland England, do you think, Mike? Absolutely, yes. That's why we're, we're that's why with the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust project, we're we're trying to work out a method that works, that, that, that allows them to bring, uh, bring up, up a reasonable number of chicks. And if we work that out, and it obviously needs um, the, the farmers to, to be with us doing this, um, then we can perhaps roll that out to other sites and, and they can um, have benefit of it. Of course, there are similar curlew groups in lots of other sites looking at it. And we, we do have a very fruitful and active exchange with other people, but uh, with these other groups. But um, you know, and unless we do something soon, we're going to be fighting a real losing battle. So give us an idea in your area then, the Seven and Avon Vales, uh, the, in, in order of severity, what are the three top three threats to, to curlews uh, productivity to producing chicks? One, two and three. I, I'm, I'm not sure I could tell, say one, two, I'd say three first equals. Um, one is loss of habitat. Um, they really do like quite damp fields uh, and damp fields are not terribly popular in the farming community. They tend to like them dry. Um, secondly, the predation, the huge number of foxes, crows and badgers, which seem to be the principal population uh, but predators, not to mention um, birds of prey like buzzards and the increasing kites that are of, of be, that are spreading everywhere. Um, sorry, so habitat change, population, and um, change in agricultural practice, uh, or, or which uh, early early cutting of silage. I mean, in some years in our area, you see silage being cut in April. When the when the curlews of yeah, not not in the floodplain sites but um, on on other sites and if it if it's dry enough the farmers obviously want will try and take three or four cuts of silage so they lose um, the I mean there's no way a curlew could survive uh, if if an, a a cut of silage is taken in April or even in May um, then there's the danger even with a late hay cut. Um, the the hay uh, if the hay is cut in 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 late June the chicks are probably still on the ground so there's a danger that of the chicks being uh, either cut cut into pieces by the cutting machines or being squashed because their instinct is to lie doggo on the ground they don't run away they just 
just sit flat on the ground and the mowing machine may hit them, which is why we need to work with the farmers to find ways of doing it. And I have to say that the, the, the farming community in our area is terribly um, pro curlew and interested and uh, is willing to lean over backwards and, and of, often some farmers have said, oh, well, if there's a curlew in my field, I'm not going to cut it. Um, and, and there needs to be some arrangement made to support far, um, curlew friendly farming, um, some sort of arrangement and it, uh, where the government simply says, OK, I'll buy your hay, hay crop off, off you, because the longer they leave it, the less value the hay has. It's, it's, it's at its best when it's when it's cut late June or, or early July. Ideally for curlews, you wouldn't cut it till August, but then the botanists start getting worried and say, oh, the co coarse grasses will take over the, um, the, 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 the interesting flowering plants. So, but what it really needs is, is a serious government uh, commitment to rewarding farmers who make special measures for curlews. Thank you, Mike. That's a very good overview of the major problems that uh, curlews face in the Seven and Avon Vales. Those problems that you've highlighted will vary in, in sort of severity, if you like, depending, they'll be slightly different in the new forest or they'll be different on Dartmoor or whatever. <clears throat> but those three seem to be, in various proportions, seem to be the issues that we have to tackle if we're going to save curlews in farmland across Britain. So that's, thank you, Mike. Um, so next we will go to uh, Richard Hanby. And Richard farms in the area where Mike works. There you go, Richard. And uh, Richard, first of all, I'd, I'd like you to tell everybody what sort of farmer you are. What, give us an overview of your farm, how big it is and, and what you do. Well, we, we've got about 300 acres of our own. We rent some more uh, off the Wildlife Trust. We have where those, those pictures are. And, um, we're mainly grass, we're a bit, a bit of arable, and we, we cut silage and hay in the summer. and and cattle in yards in the winter and also graze some. It, so you were um, told me earlier, didn't uh, you, Richard? Sorry? You said sorry, you said you were a beef farmer earlier, you broke up a little bit. Yeah, we're beef, a bit beef farmers, yes. Yeah. Mm. Do you have curly cats um, on your land? Well, well, we have had in the past and I heard one or two um, last year, but there, there was no territorial resident curlew in our immediate patch. And the, and the one of the reasons I was particularly like them is because they're the, the forerunner of spring. When you hear the curlew up there doing your doing stuff, you know spring's just around the corner. And we've got snowdrops now, they're a good start, and then they'll be daffodil. But when the curlew starts to call, you're, you're heading for spring. Yeah, so it's been part of, the curlew's been part of your farming life for a long time then. Yeah, well, we, we, we see we lost the the drumming snipe. Uh, I can just remember in my childhood sn snipe drumming, which is a very distinctive sound, once heard, never forgotten. And my father used to hear and um, then obviously in there. Uh, we just hoped that we might get a, a drumming snipe because the, the sort of ground the curd was like is good for snipe as well. Although we, yeah, uh, to stay in the summer. So you 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 um you have a really difficult equation to balance, don't you, Richard? Because you run a commercial farm; it's your job, it's your business. You pr presumably have contracts to meet and cows to feed and so on. Um, and yet, you know, the work has been showing just that farming can be quite difficult for for curlews. How does that play out in your life? Does that is that is that a big worry for you? Um, well, it would be if we had some old curlews nesting on the ground, but we we we've not had to, we've not had the opportunity of fencing a patch off for, for them. But I mean, I, I do think you need to leave quite a big space. Fencing off a ten by ten patch isn't enough. You want a nice big patch, and then of course you put a electric fence around, which will stop a fox. But um, unfortunately, you can't protect against them um, avian. Mm. Uh, I think most of our life finds, finds a curlew's nest on their fields that they would take all, all the measures they could to, to avoid damaging it. Uh, there are not, not all farmers are cooperative and I 
I know Mike's talked about compensation and that, but if a farmer is children friendly, you do everything you can to um, save them. And I think if a, if a farmer is not particularly interested or is a bit anti it, um, uh, to pay them up. So you're breaking up a bit, Richard. It was a bit difficult to hear that last bit. Um, could just go, just rewind one second. Oh, like when, said, when did you? Um, um, there, there, there's always been suggested. Carry on, sorry. Sorry, you've lost you again. <laughs> so it's a bit of a bad connection, unfortunately. Can you remember when you lost curlews on your farm? Um. I once, quite by chance, found a curlew's nest, which is just like the picture we saw not long ago, and um, with four eggs in it. But I sort of kept an eye on it from a distance. This is 20 years ago, and um, I didn't ever see any young birds. And because if, if the curlew nest there, water near it, the, either the cock or the hen will be circling above calling, and you'll know this that there's either eggs or young around then but uh, it didn't get to that yeah yeah what would you say if you, if you were in charge of farming Richard what what would you say if, if you were in charge of trying to make farming work with curlews <clears throat> well I say to start with you, you picked one of the most difficult birds out but that's not much help um I don't know it's it's, it's difficult um, others, the predators, numerically, the predators take many more than agriculture. And it, predators are, are always a bit of a moot point for conservationists. Should you kill the one bird which lives off the other bird? And you have your own opinion on that. Um, unless you lessen the that, you will. Uh, it's such a shame the, uh, the the connection isn't very good because I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on that. What about silage? How much of a problem is yeah. having to cut later? If you're going to look after curlews, you've got to cut probably in July. Is that a big problem for a farmer like you? Well, it would be. If, if we had curlews, I think we, we, we'd fence a goodly, goodly patch off for them or, or leave half a field or something. Uh, because you do need to cut your silage in, in good time to get any good quality feed. But as long as you can find the curlews, you can fence them off or, or leave that field. But um, they, have, they have some success. But it has, doesn't been a problem for us because there hasn't been any curlews with so young recently on our farm. But what about farmers who say they need the silage, that they just can't afford not to cut? Do you understand that? Well, um, you, you, you need the silage, and obviously you'll cut most of it, but just leave enough for, for the for the birds with eggs or young. That, that that wouldn't be a problem, and I think most farmers would do. Uh, it, it seems that when you get curlews on a territory, and then they lay eggs, and then of course they they're so vulnerable. I mean, they're three or four weeks before the eggs hatch, and then the chicks. Are very vulnerable even to weather because most of the ground nest waders by us have been swamped out. We've had these late bits of floods in March and April, and the curlew doesn't. Again, some of the others do, I think, and so the weather's not been kind to them. It's um, very difficult. We've got a difficult time. Yeah, the weather's changing. The patterns are changing a lot, aren't they? And very late, cold spring. Well, we, do get, we, do get, we do get the. the if a curl is swapped out, that's it for the year. Yeah. Do you think financial incentives and new agricultural schemes will help farmers to sort of be more curly friendly? Um, well, there's so, so much change in the agricultural payment incentive at the moment. No one quite knows what's happening. But um, as I said before, I think the people who are friendly and interested and like curlews will look after them anyway, whether they're paid or not. And the few which are not curlew friendly, 
would be cha would change their minds much unless it was a very big incentive. That's interesting. But thank you, Richard. That's really interesting. We'll come back to you. There's be a lot of questions, I'm sure, for you. Let's move on now because it's seven okay. o'clock yeah. to um, to Jake Fines because uh, you've now, Jake, you've heard both Mike yeah. and what Richard's got to say. So just to remind latecomers, Jake is the conservation manager for the Holcomb estate. So which means it's a massive estate in Norfolk. He'll tell you all about it in a minute, most of which is farmland. And um, uh, Jake's job is to make farming and wildlife work together. Jake is also on the board of Natural England. Um, looking, you are, aren't you? No. Oh, I thought you were. No, I, um, uh, I nearly was, but I didn't oh. make a cut. <laughs> but, I, but I represent the NFU's Environment Forum for the Eastern Region. I sit on the RSPB's England Committee. I sit on the CLA's uh, and European Landowners Association Wildlife Estates Initiative. And uh, I'm very friendly with senior civil servants. Oh, well, that's good enough. <laughs> OK, so um, you, in former life, you were a gamekeeper as well. Yeah, yeah, many moons ago. And that in both grouse and pheasant shoots? Uh, uh, mainly lo lowland, lowland uh, game. Uh, so actually the bulk of my career was a uh, wild game. So wild pheasants and partridges. Right, excellent. OK, Jake, so you've got a history in the sort of the, the, the on big estates. You're now working with farming and wildlife. So how do you see, I mean, the curlew represents such an interesting bird to look at, isn't it? Because it tells us about the health of farm landscapes at the moment. It's telling us that all is not well. You hear the shocking statistics from Mike. Um, and the fact that farmers have this equation to balance and some will need to be persuaded to do more to look after curlews. How, how do you see the curlew fitting into the farm landscape at the moment? So, so uh, you have to generalise. You know, our, our landscapes are rich and diverse and have the opportunity to, to, to provide so much more than they do currently. So the, cur the curlew, I, I, I just feel there's a strong West Country uh, contingent today and most people wouldn't associate curlew with Norfolk and Suffolk but actually we do have in in the probably some of the most intense agriculture in the UK in in East Anglia we do have relatively <coughs> stable relatively productive curlew uh, in um, in and around uh, East Anglia so uh, so it's amazing how you can make space for key indicator species. Now, uh, the curlew might not be uh, a, 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 a key indicator species for your particular farm, um, but it's actually, it's it's surprising how little space curlew need. Um, and actually, it's the creation of the habitat uh, that actually provides, you know, I love the comment from Mike about the botanist. You can't please everyone all of the time, but you can actually, <laughs> please the majority by ensuring that it is rich and diverse botanically, that it's providing homes for voles and feeding for barn owls and also nesting for curly. So I think from my perspective, it's all about the creation of the mosaic of habitat that uh, provides a rich source uh, for a range of species to thrive and, and develop in. And something that, you know, we've seen, you know, through through government or European incentives, we have seen the degradation of our environment over the last 70 years. Uh, and that is, it is possible to return, return back to, you know, to halt decline is relatively straightforward. And actually there are some wonderful examples across the country where we've seen a resurgence of, of, of species that have seen decline since the seventies. So it is possible. So we mustn't feel that it is, you know, extinction, the world is, is nigh and extinction is Im imminent. Actually, we must have a much more positive aspect on this. And we look at the changes in policy um, which actually give us this, this amazing opportunity to um, reward those that provide us with, you know, the, the provide us with the, the, the key essentials of, of natural ecosystem services. OK, Jake, you've got a presentation. Let's, for those of you, it, you there is quite a, a West Country bias, certainly. <laughs> so let's have a look at Holcomb because the other side of the country, you've got a presentation for us. OK, I'm going to try and use the technology. 
and someone's got to tell me whether it's working because I can't see what's happening. Yeah, that's working. That's good. Okay, so um, my mantra is about making space for everything. Um, but today, because Mary asked me to talk about um, uh, or talk about policy, it's actually for, from my perspective. I'm going to just focus on uh, ground nesting waders. So something that you know. So the Holcombe National Nature Reserve, which I'm very lucky to to um, manage, uh, which is uh, just under 10,000 acres, half of it which is owned by the estate. Um, and there's about two and a half thousand acres of wet grassland for breeding waders. Uh, we've never been a site for curlew, although Norfolk has records of curlew um, uh, nesting uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Mary would be able to correct me on the exact timing. But although the, the Brex, you know, the sandy soils uh, near Thetford Forest, um, actually do have a population of curly breeding. So, but the, the, but the bulk of uh, uh, East Anglia actually has never, either never had curly successfully breed, um, or if, if they were, they've actually, we've seen the demise. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, a tale of two, two sides in, in, the, in the East of England. Um, so, so what I've done is, in my whole my career, although I was a gamekeeper and it was on a uh, you know I, 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 it was for again my focus on a wild bird shoot was for ground nesting birds. Everything had, from my perspective has been about the creation of habitat, and we have this wonderful opportunity to create more habitat in the right place. Um, we've heard from a from a wonderful farmer, which is, I think is really important because they are the key. They are the key to delivering all of our aspirations. And actually, we can integrate farming with nature. We can, you know, on the, the Holcomb National Nature Reserve had not seen drumming snipe for 15, 17 years. Last, not last year, the year before, we had we had drumming snipe return. So, you know, so yeah, so, so there there is hope, and there is, you know, it's just subtle small changes can make significant differences. And I know there are some of the economic challenges to work, but we have seen so at Holcomb, we've returned the lapwing population back to what it was, the breeding population back to what it was in 2000. We've seen record, and I remember avocets, I used to manage an estate in South Norfolk, where we uh, we had the return of the avocet, which was at one stage considered a species uh, breeding in the UK on the brink of extinction. And we've seen this huge increase in avocet numbers. Um, and Holcomb, two years on, uh, three years on the bounce, we've uh, broken the record of the breeding population of avocets on this on the reserve. So there, there is hope with these other waders. You know, we can see, we can change things that make differences. Um, but we're going. But it is all driven by policy. There's, so the CAP, so the milk, uh, looking at the wonderful uh, West Country faces I've seen on my screen, uh, you will all remember the uh, uh, butter mountains and milk lakes of the of the 70s and early 80s. And we saw uh, we saw the European uh, common agricultural policy uh, developed for production of ever cheaper uh, food and uh, and the, the payment for farmers to remove hedges and drain drain wetlands uh, and farm every inch of their land to uh, to produce more co commodities. But we've seen a change. So as uh, in the process of that wonderful moment where we all voted whether we were going to stay in Europe or not, uh, uh, the Michael Gove, the current Secretary of State, actually uh, did a consultation, which was the Health and Harmony paper. And that was to engage with everyone on uh, how we move forward. And he then created the 25-year environment plan and uh, payment for public goods uh, and uh, paying farmers to deliver ecosystem services and the six public goods were clean and plentiful water, clean air, mitigation against environmental hazards like flood and drought, mitigation for climate change, thriving plants and nature, um, and, and also intrinsic value, so beauty, heritage um, uh, with our natural environment. These were all the ambitions of the Health and Harmony paper. And these were realized when we left Europe, when we decided in that wonderful moment that you either loved it or you hated it, and it was a 50-50. Um, uh, so we, we left Europe. And that then, once we left Europe, we had, uh, seemed to take an age, but we then went through Parliament, the Agricultural Act, which effectively meant 
the way we would support our farmers. And 70% of the UK is in some form of agriculture. That was uh, very slowly followed by the Environment Act, which would then put in place the key uh, processes to allow, to allow us to ensure that we protected and maintained our nature. And that was battled backwards and forwards through the, between the House of Commons and the Lords. So we got, we got the legislation in place and then we have the transition. And the transition for many farmers started in 2021, but most of them don't no, didn't notice it because they removed the support through the Common Agricultural Policy, which was a payment for every hectare of land you farmed. We're now going to see a steady degradation of that payment to allow the new payments of environmental land management. Uh, and it's all wonderful DEFRA civil service speak, but actually um, it's, it's split into three sections. One of it is sustainable farming incentive, which basically is going to reward farmers for more environmentally or climate change practices. Um, uh, and it's going through a rather rocky stage and allegedly this year, some of the first payments will be eligible to farmers um, as they've seen so they can recoup some of their direct support that they will see slowly disappearing over the next seven years. Um, uh, and that's going to be rolled out this year. That's not going to help Curlew, but the big one in my book, the one that will help Curlew is local nature recovery. And local nature recovery is basically what farmers have been paid for for about the last 30 years, nearly my entire career in land management, um, is pay them to deliver all of the uh, uh, thriving plants and nature part of the public goods. Um, so it will protect watercourses, so that protects water. It will project, uh, create habitats for uh, a range of species. And this is where we need to really understand. And only I'm going to um, a presentation by the chair of Natural England, Tony Juniper, in the uh, middle of March, where Natural England are going to present their local nature uh, recovery strategies. And this is, re this is a really key moment where Natural England, which are the, uh, you know, are the, they're also with, alongside with DEFRA, so DEFRA are actually having more input than I've ever seen in, in the last 20 years in the design of some of these schemes. And this is being set alongside uh, Natural England, guiding them on what they think is right. So we will see these strategies come forward. And, you know, where Mike earlier on was talking about the floodplains and we will, how we buffer these floodplains. Now we can ensure that farmers that actually farm and try and produce forage for their livestock and trying to produce um, uh, uh, commodities to sell to ensure that they have a viable business will be rewarded for, the, for, for these uh, local nature recovery strategies and implementing uh, good practice that benefits the farmer and actually the, re the reward for the farmer is key because they're going to see their direct support disappear. And this is something that is still under negotiation and that's part of the treasury. And there was a, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a review, there were, there's been lots of reviews, but there was one review called the Descupta Review, which most of you will be blissfully unaware of. And this was a review that was uh, commissioned by the treasury. And it actually, um, Professor Descupta, uh, uh, it's a 604 page document, but the 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 um, the summary is wonderful where we how do we put a value on our natural world? How do we put a value on nature? Something that we've had uh, for so long for free. So uh, whether that's the how do you put a price on a curly wave? How do you put a price on a salt marsh? How do you put a price on a bit of semi ancient natural woodland? Um, how do you put a price on a on a landscape that is has herit heritage and agricultural history to it so this is something that is being grappled with um, and there's you know um, uh, natural capital asset registers are something that the finance part of the world haven't a clue how to get their minds around so there's a lot going on and there's a lot of people influencing and with uh, and there is slowly making change the last one which i'll touch on ever so briefly which is landscape recovery which has from the farming uh, sector has had relatively quite a lot of criticism because uh, uh, our, the secretary of state george eustace was proposing that we'd have three hundred thousand uh, hectares of land into landscape recovery by 
2042, I think, and there will be 15, there will be a landscape recovery pilot uh, applications which are currently live for 15 uh, schemes to go ahead. 300,000 hectares sounds like a lot, but actually local nature recovery has the potential to deliver on four, five, six million hectares of British agriculture by rewarding farmers and by connecting landscapes and allowing nature to move through the landscape, allowing curlews to have the habitat they want, allowing the butterflies and the orchids to sit alongside their chicks. Um, so wonderful stuff, it's happening, it's slow. There's challenges from those that uh, want to maintain a, a system that has been in place for decades. Uh, there's also the next generation, which I'm deeply encouraged with some of the, the young farmers and young landowners that I speak to are actually are really happy to take on this gauntlet and deliver. And that gives me encouragement. We have the issue with food security. Currently, you know, depending on who you speak to, we're ending between 60 and 70 percent uh, have our, uh, 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 are, are self-sufficient in our food. The problem is actually a lot of the inputs in the food we produce come from elsewhere around the world. So that's an issue. We have an inflation, uh, and I think, judging by the average age of the uh, uh, of everyone this evening, most people will remember inflation in the 70s. Um, so, uh, but a lot of young people can't remember that. We've got profitable farming. We have the DEFRA's current stats are suggesting that 60% uh, of farm businesses are unviable without support. So, how do we ensure that those businesses continue? And can we ask them to continue in a way that is actually providing all of the six public goods that um, I, I referred to earlier? We have the other issue where we actually make this place so amazingly wonderful for nature that actually we go and buy cheap food elsewhere. Uh, and I think it was this week where I was hearing about vast acres of rainforest being cut down to produce soya to feed probably British poultry and pigs. Um, we have carbon targets, something that no one, everyone is unaware of carbon targets. You know, it's an, it's an, an it's a wonderful world, and the the, uh, the corporations and the global industry are desperate to offset their businesses because they feel that there are they have um, social and economic responsibility to uh, to demonstrate this, but it's a it's a science that is is, is untested. Strangely, my belief is actually something that you can verify and measure. Uh, and quantify is biodiversity. So can we get the corporations to buy into that? And I think uh, the Prince of Wales in a um, in an interview, uh, I think that was in, in December, where governments have billions, but global corporations have trillions. So there's a whole new, so if we're going to pay individuals eco, uh, for ecosystem services, we actually need to have blended finance. We need government to ensure that we have something to allow these, these, uh, uh, these contracts to take place, to allow big corporations to start investing in our natural world and preventing uh, ever uh, degradation on our natural resources, because fundamentally that maintains their business. So there's and there's a lot of there's a lot of interest from uh, from the from uh, 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 private private investment on this. And the big one, you know, COVID is nothing. COVID is short change when it comes to issues we have as a global society. Climate change. I was very lucky to speak in Glasgow uh, in November, um, and actually the target of meeting, you know, what are we going to all experience in the next 72 hours is climate change. We're going to have two horrific. Uh, wind storms uh, come across the UK. You know, I remember 19, uh, 1997 and that first hurricane. And I was in Sussex at the time and we lost. And that's when uh, I think it was six of the seven oaks of seven oaks got blown or blown down. And we've already seen some of the damage in Scotland where millions of trees have fallen over and we've got this ambition to plant more of them. So climate change is uh, is something we really have to grapple with more than anything. And as someone referred, I saw briefly in some in the chat, someone referring to curlews and climate change. Yes, that we, we will see uh, we will see some species will be really challenged by climate change. And if we can, you know, the reality of trying to maintain uh, uh, the global global uh, temperature rise by 1.5, which was discussed at COP, is uh, currently 
I'm not confident, but I think we could quite happily get to two if we start making a difference now. And everyone was talking the, the targets of 2030. 2030 is horribly close. It's eight years away. Um, so there are lots of challenges, but actually, so this is the Holcomb National Nature Reserve. This is the uh, piece of land I'm very lucky to look after. It's rich and diverse. It's full of nature. Um, it uh, has a, over a million visitors uh, uh, pro, uh, in 500,000 cars. It has, we have 300,000 dogs, and so on the challenges of dogs and ground nesting birds. But it is, it is a wonderful demonstration of what, when we have connectivity, what we can deliver. And um, there's a program on BBC One that's aired every Sunday evening at six o'clock, um, uh, something to do with the countryside. And um, uh, interestingly, uh, they filmed on the reserve, which will go out this week, where we, um, the first thing I said when I spoke to camera was, this is fundamentally a functioning farm. This is a farm business that produces uh, beef with 800 cattle grazing it. And the intrinsic relationship between the cattle and the curlew and the lapwing and the snipe is really key. And it's how we integrate our farming with our nature um, is uh, it's it's possible, and, and and that's what we're doing at Holcomb. So I've talked for far too long. Mary's going to ask me some really difficult questions. <laughs> no, I'm not going to ask difficult questions. But what I am going to say, thank you for that, Jake. And that was a, a fantastic crash course in what's happening in agricultural policy at the moment. And you're very upbeat about it, which is really nice to hear because we get so much negative news at the moment um, but still in my mind you know we heard from Mike that the productivity of curlews in the Seven and Aden Vales and not just in the Seven pretty much I know Brex are doing better than anywhere else and and we have um, Harry Ewing who, who's doing an amazing PhD on the Brex curlews um, and joining us you know he's in the audience tonight but even there they're not reaching the, the level they need to reach. They're appalling in some places. Some places produce no chicks at all every year. So we have that crisis situation across lowland England with curlews. Um, and we have a, a farmer like Richard who, who lost his curlews quite a long time ago on his farm. And, you know, I'm not sure he's getting them back anytime soon, considering what's going on. You've given us the big picture about all the great plans and what's happening, but I don't know that we've got time I don't know the birds have time to respond to this very slow. I know it's fast in, in sort of one level, but for the curlews who are in such a crisis in lowland England, do you think we can do it in time? Can we change landscapes fast enough? So we can change landscapes very quickly. There are two points in every year that we can make a difference. It's called the spring and the autumn. And every farmer in Richmond will know he makes decisions at those times of year that can have key key differences to his productivity. And we can apply those so, same principles. The frustration is the 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 slowness, the, the slow pace of policy that doesn't allow this to take place. And that's the challenge. And you know, if I look at some of some of the examples that I've witnessed where we've seen radical increase in nature productivity these were fu funded through past policy and we've got an emerging policy and the secretary of state talks about an evolution rather than a revolution quite frankly we need a revolution we need to reward we need to reward those that are at the at the coal face of the revolution to to, to for let them to understand that we recognize them and uh, and it is a, a burden, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this curly can live up to forty years, thirty, it, thirty years, and it needs to replicate itself uh, five times in its lifetime. Uh, so so already, if I look at, if I give an example of oyster catchers on the Norfolk coast, because we don't we, we only have foreign curly, and actually um, We've seen the decline because of a range of different reasons, uh, seen the decline in the productivity of oyster catchers. But actually, I need five, six, ten years of unprecedented productivity to prevent the decline further. So that same that same 
application applies to to curly. So um, yeah, no, the clock is ticking. I'm 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 I am more than aware, and I what I don't wish is I don't wish that lowland curly become a martyr species for conservation like you know i was very lucky to go to the natural history museum and seeing um darwin's original origin of species and then i just and then you see a stuffed dodo and you think what we don't want is we don't want the curlew to be the icon of something that 20 21st century humanity lost from our landscape well we've already lost the the slender bill curlew and the eskimo curlew so, um, you know, it, there is there's history on this one and, uh, and time isn't on our side. But I think that was, Jake, that was a very good, really succinct and, and very dynamic summary of where farming could be going, given money, will and, and you know, some, some sort of speed behind it. We can change things. We've heard from Mike about the dire situation in, in Seven Aden Vales. And some very hopeful stuff as well from Richard saying, you know, if there were curlew, he would do something about it. And they may have gone, but if they come back, he'd be willing to help them. So I think now, if people have to go, we're about half past and knew we'd be over. But if people have to go, of course, just just uh, sign out. But if you can stay, we'll have a few questions. Ellen, have you collated any from the chat box? Yeah, yeah. So we've got so many. So we're definitely not going to be able to get through all of them. But I will... I've gone back right to the start and we've got quite a lot for Mike. Um, and so one of them was, Caroline says, hi, Mike, I'm interested to know whether you've noticed a particular height of vegetation is required for curlews to nest. Oh, um, the thing is, they, the curly, curlew is the biggest wader. Uh, and therefore it has to it it can't start nesting very early in the season as lapwings often do lapwings sit sit out in in the middle of the open field and you you wonder why carrion crows don't see them a mile off but they sometimes do sit, but they sometimes get their first broods off curlews being so big uh, have to wait until the grass has grown a little bit before they can start, uh, before they can safely uh, lay eggs. And of course, um, in, um, in, in these floodplain situations, the grass grows incredibly fast. That's why it's such a problem to, to, to find the nests. If, if you don't find, find the nests by the end of April, you've pretty much had it. Um, so yes, they do need a certain amount uh, of um, of, of growth before that before they nest, but they don't need it to be too thick. Um, th there are <clears throat> there are some of the places that we look at which get really massively thick areas of buttercups in, uh, quite early on in the season, and you just can't imagine that the curlew could possibly be be nesting in there. Of course, farmers don't much like buttercups because they're they're not very good <laughs> good for the cattle. But um, that that's happening in some places. So yes, it it um it need it needs to be of a reasonable length before they'll start nesting, uh, but not too not not too thick and not too dense uh, as the season goes on, because the chicks when they hatch feed themselves so um, they can't be going around in a sort of real jungle of butterfly of, of buttercup uh, uh, thick uh, plants they need to be able to pick about and pick and feed themselves they feed themselves from uh, 24 uh, 24 hours and um, the parents never feed feed young curlews or any young waders they except for oyster catchers which are an exception uh, but the um, Curlew chicks feed themselves from uh, once as soon as they're dried out and running about. They feed themselves, so the grass doesn't have to be too long, uh, so that they can actually find their way around. I think, as far as I know, that there's an optimal height of around about ten centimetres. I don't know if Harry Ewing's still with us. Harry, turn your your sound on, and and do you have a, a figure-ish, an average figure, if you're still there? Might not still be there, but I, that's the sort of length that um, I heard. So um, next question. OK, so I'm going to go to for uh, one for Jake. Ellie asks, how important do you think pred uh, predation management is for curly recovery in the lowlands? Uh, 
whilst we have an imbalance of predator and prey, it's fundamentally important um, uh, uh, for a range of reasons. So we have uh, uh, we have urban urban foxes. Urban fox populations are ever increasing. Those that you that live in Bristol will be more. Than, I think the Bristol fox population is one of the highest in the country. Um, uh, and there have been a series of reports on why the why our uh, our predation our predator populations are so high. If I look at mammalian predators specifically, um, uh, and there have you know so because there is a, an abundance of food, and that can be related to a range of reasons. Uh, because if you if I go elsewhere in Europe, I don't see large numbers of apex predators because that's their, their numbers are dictated by food abundance. Uh, but once, <laughs> you have, once, you, once you have a, uh, if I look at Holcomb National Nature Reserve, where we control foxes and corvids, um, but actually we have such a lot, we have such an range of different habitats and uh, in different structures and sizes, and so we have ensure that there's a, an element of heterogeneity about, so, Snipe, snipe can crawl into cow pats, and red shank can hide between junkers, and lapwing can nest on bowling greens. Actually, and as the vegetation uh, grows through the summer, there is protection for those species. So the abundance of the large quantities of avian predators that we don't control. Actually, you know, we had twelve uh, marsh harrier nests last year. And they only produced 12 young because that was based on the abundance of food. But we do control foxes because, you know, fragile ground nesting bird populations can have, uh, there can be horrific uh, uh, population declines or predation instances when you get a, an individual fox that becomes a specialist on a particular uh, uh, ground nesting bird. Mm -hmm. So, so I think species management, as I prefer to uh, refer to it, does have a place currently. Uh, and I think in a in a country relatively small with high numbers of people and infrastructure and roads and urban areas, I think it will always have a place in some form of description. Okay, um, and then so I'm gonna I'll ha I have another one from Mike, but this one follows along really well from that one. So Daniela, this one is is actually for Jake. Um, was predation investigated with camera traps? So so. So I have a team of wardens and their main role is to record nature and enhance the, the environment. And I also have a, a, a team of gamekeepers. And what we've used is I've invested in, I bought, I don't know, I think I bought 30 camera traps last year. So that we use the camera traps to identify our most effective and efficient way to control our predators. So there's a, there's a, there's a species management WhatsApp group that actually, if a, Fox is caught on camera at 7.43 of the evening, the gamekeepers are, uh, are uh, notified that this is happening and they get there at seven o'clock and actually they're sat up and waiting because a fox is a creature of habit. So yes, we do. We, we also tried to identify, so we uh, unsuccessfully tried to apply for a gull license and we used camera tracks to see if uh, uh, lesser black black gulls were having impacts on uh, breeding waders, uh, and that was quite a difficult one to establish. But I think the use of camera trap, the use of modern technology is really important. We must embrace this. So, um, yeah, I'm no, a big, big fan of uh, apps and traps and cameras and or camera traps and, uh, and, and ensuring that information is disseminated to as many people as possible. Yes. Um May I come in on that one? Uh, we you, we've used um, camera uh, trail cameras as well to look at predators, and what we're now trying, what we've tried on, in a small way, and are hoping to develop as well, is use of drones to find nests because we've got these huge fi grassy fields with one curlew sitting in the middle of middle of it, and uh, terribly difficult to find. So we're using heat-seeking drones with an infrared camera on it in the hope that that will pick up the warmth of the body of the sitting bird early in the morning or late in the evening. We tried it a, a little bit um, in the last two years. Uh, we had problems with the machinery, but we think this is a, a really big uh, potential uh, uh, 
potential tool for for fi finding nest easily and and protecting them and can I agree entirely with what Jake has said about the abundance of predators in, in, in Britain? And one of the things that um, all the scientists are constantly saying is why are, we don't know why there are just so many uh, of these middle predators, the foxes and the, and the crows. It's something to do with food ability, availability, something to do with uh, lack of uh, top, pre top predators. Then really needs to be a national level uh, investigation and, and then drawing some conclusions about um, how this has come about and, and where we need to go with it. I'm just saying that we will have um, a curlew action seminar, one of these actually on predators and um, coming up in, in the series. So look out for that one. So, OK, so many questions. Um, this this one, Richard, you're probably the best person to answer this. Uh, Susanna would like to know whether you are offered any compensation for leaving part of your silage uncut. <clears throat> no, there's not. I don't think there's a scheme at the moment which allows that. Um, it's not happened to me because obviously I haven't had a, a bird, uh, a nest in my fields for a long time. But I don't think there is a, is a scheme at the moment. Um, Richard, uh, we, were, we were wondering whether there's any chance of doing a um, uh, uh, any silage swapping with farmers. Do you think farmers would be up for that? Uh, not very, not very much. I think. I think the best thing is, is I mean, if, if there was compensation. <clears throat> to, to leave the field uncut, it might be handy, but <clears throat> as I said before, I think the farmers who are friendly and, and um, that look forward to having kernels about will do all they can to protect them, and the ones that don't probably wouldn't be persuaded by a, a scheme like that. Okay, interesting. We'll do have a couple more questions, and I think we ought to. <laughs> yeah, we'll, do, we'll just do two more. So, um, Mike, you're probably the best person to answer this one. Julie would like to know whether curlews feed off any pest species of invertebrates which affects farmed crops. Oh, uh, not that we know of. They generally, um, I, I've been looking really quite quite closely uh, in the last couple of weeks, at, at not so much as breeding curlews as wintering curlews, that they, they often like to feed on inland wet grassy fields. Ridge and furrow fields are often particularly good because they haven't been ploughed up and so they have a long, uh, a, a, a sort of long time for the uh, invertebrate populations to breed. Curlews eat, uh, feed either by picking on the surface uh, so they must be picking up insects on the surface, but they also, you can see them st standing and dig, probing really deeply with their, their, their long bills. Um, they seem to sense worms under the, moving under the ground and you can see them uh, latch onto a worm and then really tug, tug it right back up and, 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 and pull it up. I don't think that um, there are any um, uh, particular predator um, pest insects that uh, that that cur curlews eat, but this is one huge area of ignorance. We uh, we know very little about um, exactly which insects curlews and uh, and other waders feed on, uh, and um, we know uh, very little ab about. Which kinds of in, which kinds of insects are in the grassland? We've we've moved from curlews to botany. Now we need need to move on from botany to invertebrates. <laughs> there is an awful lot we don't know. Yeah. Any more last couple of questions, Ellen? Yes. So, um, okay. Sorry, this is quite a long one, so I'll just try and condense it. So, are these areas drained to allow farming, and is there a potential to restore these areas to permanent wetlands? And would that help waders? Jake, do you want to try and answer that? Is there any prescription coming in to re-wet farmland? Um, so uh, the devil's in the detail and we haven't got any, but I, I, I am pretty much, a sh uh, uh, I, I, I'm pretty, I'm very confident that actually the drainage of the deeps of the 70s and the, well, the 50s, 60s and 70s actually, you know, I can think of three three areas that I've uh, reversed the drainage, um, and I think there will there will be some sort of intense intense uh, 
incentivization from that. Um, invariably, a lot of the land that was drained has become more difficult to be farmed because there's a series of uh, uh, pest and disease thresholds that are becoming uh, more challenging for farmers. So I think this is probably a much, uh, it's an easier route to, to travel down to actually to create a wetland. So the benefits on biodiversity, the benefits on carbon, the benefits on connecting uh, landscapes through uh, wetlands and river systems, I think we'll, we'll see significant funding. I think wetlands are going to be a big, a big feature of the future, I think. Um, there were, I was looking at the chat and some people are saying it's very sort of southern focused. What about the sort of farms in the uplands? We are having an upland management um, session or seminar as well. So uh, if you can join us for that one, um, we probably don't have time to cover because the different issues in the uplands and the lowlands. So we very much wanted just to focus this first one on the lowlands. Um, Last question, Alan. Well, the one that I looked at was actually <laughs> going to be, do we know why they've reduced in the uplands? Um, but maybe I'll leave that off until we do an entire seminar on it. Um, OK. Uh, Paul would like to know how far away from the nest do parents bird fly to feed during the nesting and fledging time, please? <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat that? So how far away would parents fly from the nest to, to feed? Do they stay quite close? Yes, they do, they don't go terribly far. Um, that, the, that that's why I was talking about being able to identify individuals. If you know that there's a pair and one of the one of the a pair of adults and one is uh, is 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 ringed or has some way you can identify it, um, you'll you'll find that basically. Um, when once the young hatch, uh, mum and dad hang hang around. They stay. They stand quite close to the young ones, uh, and you can only observe this when you've got them on cut hayfields. If they're in an uncut hayfield, you you can't see what's happening, of course. Uh, but what they do is to um, they stand around fairly close to the young ones. And the young ones just run around and the parents sort of follow them about and try and look after them. Uh, and they may often, we're quite surprised sometimes at how far they move, move. They may move over several fields. You know they've nested in one field and you'll find them three fields away uh, just simply because the young wander all over the place and the adults try and try and keep them under control. Um, what happens with curlews, as with many waders, is that um, mum does most of the incubating uh, and then when they're hatched, she hangs around, say, for a fortnight, given a, a curlew takes four or five weeks to fledge. For a couple of weeks, mum hangs around and then, then she goes off and leaves dad to look after them until they actually fledge. So uh, um, in when you're into June, July, and um, there's very often only one parent, uh, and it, it's 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 dad who looks after the um, the young ones until they until they fledge, and you can tell the um, males and females apart. They they look pretty similar in plumage, but the males are a good deal smaller, and have shorter. Um, m sort of more regularly curved beaks. The, the females sort of have a, a long beak which sort of turns down at the, at, at the ends. When, when you get your eye in, you can probably, you can do that though, as I say, a, a ring on it helps. So no, they don't go very, very far away. Um, when the females n nesting uh, on, on eggs very often, just um, if you see one bird sitting around on its own, not doing very much in a field. That's often the off-duty bird sitting fairly close to the nest, and that's often a, a hint of where the nest might be. But you ha you have to get your eye in to pick up these sort of things. There was um, one question. Oh yes, sorry, Jay. I was got a question for you, Jake. But what did you want to comment on that? No, no. So I just I I I I want. To, I've seen a question. I'd like to respond to. Oh, maybe the same question that I want you to respond to. <laughs> well, I'll let you go first then. <laughs> Phil Sheldrake says, uh, is that the one? Um, That's the one. <laughs> so you were a gamekeeper um, shooting pheasants and partridge and 
the, the large numbers of game that are released into the countryside is one of the reasons that people think we have so many predators. So uh, guilty as charged, Jake? So um, very, very poignant question, Philip, but the, the, the majority of my gamekeeping career, I was a wild gamekeeper. So um, we didn't release any game at all. Um, so we are aware that there's anything between 40 and 70 million game birds released in the UK every year. Um, and actually, I, I think the maths would suggest that actually they are having a, uh, a beneficial effect on uh, uh, foxes and crows. I think that's, you know, there's got to be, it's, it's, it, it's got to be relatively obvious. So in your question, Philip, do we release pheasants and partridges on Holcombe? Yes, we do. And we probably do. That's because what the majority of lowland uh, estates or farms with a shooting interest do release. Uh, we release at relatively low levels. So 25,000 acres of the Holcombe estate is uh, quite a significant area. Um, and uh, we are releasing not even uh, a third of that uh, birds per acre. So we're relatively low level shooting. But I am aware in the West Country that there are some significantly higher releases of uh, pheasants and partridges, which undoubtedly will be having an impact. That was a nice challenging one to, to, to end with, I think. Ellen, have you got, do we call it a day on that? I think yes, probably probably time to call it a day. I think <laughs> before we get too controversial. But look, I just <laughs> want to say thank you to everybody who joined this seminar tonight. We, the idea was to give an overview of the of how curlews fit into farmland, and I think Mike, Richard, and Jake did that really well. And I certainly learned some things actually tonight. Um, it's good to just get this overview from people. Um, so that we can feel more informed as, as it's a fast moving landscape out there at the moment with how agriculture is going to develop post Brexit. Jake's right in the heart of it. Um, Mike sees it on the ground. Uh, Richard Bakes is living out of it. So it's it's really thank you, you three, for coming along tonight and talking to us and for everybody who signed up. Please join us for more of our seminars. You've got the feel of them now. General uh, interest seminars, not not uh, aimed at the specialists, but aimed at people who just want to know more so they can be more informed about the debates that are going on. So um, if you can, please, please, please um, support Roger on his thousand mile walk. Roger, give us a, ra a rave. Come on, give us a wave. Roger, does this look like a man who can walk a thousand miles through the UK? Of course he does. <laughs> and he's going to raise lots of money for Curlew Action. And we really would be so appreciated if you'd sponsor us. Um, sponsor uh, Roger so it can all go to supporting what we do and we see our role public access public outreach information as key to what Curlew Action does so thank you for coming tonight please support us and we'll see you at the next one and thank you to our speakers bye bye everybody thanks so much <laughs>